After a tough stretch of games, the Leafs finally put a couple of wins together, albeit one was against the lowly Blackhawks in which they had to scratch their way out of a 2 nothing deficit to come back and win it in overtime. And then they defeated the Detroit Red Wings at home, and even that one, they blew a couple of two-goal leads and almost blew it at the end. Having said that, cause for optimism, two wins. Frank, I'm going to kick it to you first. Other than the two wins, is there something that gives you optimism that you've seen lately about this Leafs team? This might be a quick response. Uh, (laughs) uh, Yeah, I guess, you know, I was pretty encouraged by the way they started uh, against the Red Wings on Saturday. Uh, I mean, even a broken clock is right twice a day, right? Yes, it's one. It's (laughs) It's about time. I said, I'm, I'm I'm giving you one. So if you're asking me about that game, yeah, it was good. Um, uh, you know, one thing we've talked about here before is that killer instinct. And I think, you know, uh, Shanahan, when they said, you know, they're lacking it. But, like, how about putting a team away when you, like, when you're the better team in the game? I, 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 at some point, we had to stop having these conversations about the Leafs getting goalied. Yeah, Grace played well, but they also have 40-something shots on net. you got to put a team away. And that's getting to the dirty areas and, and and scoring, you know, and they had a couple of those greasy goals, you know, Marner's is not going to come easier than that. Um, so that was my first, the second one, uh, now as play on the Marner was, you got to give the guy credit. He was better in Chicago. He was better. Uh, he had a, another, uh, it was better against Detroit than the Chicago game. Guys like him, guys like Matthews, we only get on them because of the contract, but they're going to figure it out. So my whole point with this, the, the second point was they're getting scoring from guys not named Marner and Matthews. They, they're getting it from Kerfoot. They're getting it from Spezza. Uh, um, uh, Bunting is, is chipping in. It, it, that is somewhat of a positive because, like I said, the big guys are going to figure it out. The third thing for me, um, we, we talked about this, is um, you're starting to see some more accountability. And really what I mean by that is the Justin Hall situation. Whether he's hurt. Uh, whether he's just having some some uh, whether it's uh, mental issues on on the ice or he's not really lacking confidence in his game, Keith has come out and now he's approached him as a pair with Muzzin and Hall, but more Hall specifically is listen, he's being paid a certain amount. We expect him to play a certain uh, to a certain level. He's not. He's out. And Lilligren's in. And it's not a one game, hey, you know, uh, watch the game and, and, and you know, tell me what you learned from it. No, no, he's actually out again. He's not playing against uh, Vegas on the Tuesday. So this is more of that accountability. Um, these are those – now, I want to see the same type of accountability for these guys like Engvall, Simmons even. Um, you know, because are we confident that he's going to be in every – he's been okay this year, but are we confident he's going to be in? Nick Ritchie, who's making $2.5 This is the type of stuff – where you build that internal competition. Um, and I'm sure they have some roster spots now because they did lose Amadio on waivers. So they'll probably have a little bit of room to bring up another guy. Could be Semyonov, could be Anderson. Uh, I don't think it'd be Hosang yet. But once you start bringing these guys up, you're going to start creating that competition more and more. And and again, I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but I'm just trying to look a little bit down the road and see kind of what they're starting to build. It's a little bit better. The messaging's better. So, you know, t- take take it as it goes. So I'll, I'll, I'll end off with those. All right. So those are good reasons to be optimistic that their play will improve. Reasons for pessimism. For me, I would have to go with their defensive play in general. I think the goals are going to come. I'm not really worried uh, about the goals. I mean, they're, they're first in a lot of offensive categories. If you looked at advanced metrics, expected goals, shots for... All of that stuff, like they're they're really high and they should have more goals. So eventually the puck's just going to start going in. They've hit a lot of posts so far, it seems like. Tavares has hit, what, three or four so far. I'm not worried about that. It's the defensive play. I, I know their system is to press, especially in the offensive zone, but I don't know if guys aren't covering for one another. This isn't just the defensive core. It's the team as a whole. A lot of odd man rushes. A lot of... Um, yeah. Inability yeah. to get the puck out of their zone, which we didn't see a lot of last year. They cleaned a lot of this stuff up last year, but it's been a real rough goal to start the year. So one thing with that is, um, and I don't want to like focus on it specifically because we really don't know. There's probably a lot of reasons to it. But uh, Dave Haxtell, uh, when he became Seattle's coach, he was mostly taking care of the defense and the penalty killing 
role on the special team side. They now have Dean Shanif, Sh- uh, Shanif, Sh- Dean, and uh, Shanoth. That's it. And uh, he was he came over from Carolina. He was pretty much one of the guys responsible for uh, you know having Carolina put a system in to essentially what they are now. Carolina is for me the best team in the league uh, as it sits right now. So uh, you're bringing in a new system from a guy. Uh, it's a little bit different than Haxtell, but what you're still seeing is that aggressiveness at the blue lines, at the red lines, um, even aggressive penalty kill. It's 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 active defensemen. It, it's having them uh, pinch down. You see Sandine's doing it a lot, and Sandine's actually doing a good job of it, picking his spots. Uh, who's not doing a good job of it, who didn't do a good job of it last year, is our new $7.5 million defenseman, but we'll get into that. Um, but still, you're seeing a lot of those odd man rushes because – uh, the coaches want them to be activated. Um, it doesn't look like they're going to stop anytime soon. So it, it's that consta- uh, constant pressure that they keep in the offensive zone. So I don't see that changing, Joe. So I don't know how they're going to change that or how they're going to address that. Uh, but it seems like they're kind of kind of live and die with that type of uh, full court press, uh, for lack of a better term. So um, I, I really didn't like the way they, they kind of, uh, I wouldn't say hung Mrazic out to dry in, in a game, but like, it, you know, they still kept going. You heard Bieksa say it uh, on the telecast. They they didn't they didn't sit back. It's almost like damn if you do, damn if you don't. If the Leafs sit back, they're gonna come back. So they they just kind of st- stood in your stay in your face. They just gotta learn when to pick those chances, and when to go, and when to not. Because if if the if you start to play something you're not used to, you don't or, or you have the talent to play a certain style, and you play the opposite, that could have actually an, an adverse effect. So I, I would rather them stay consistent. Uh, it's just that these D pairings are now going to be a little bit different now. With Brody not playing with Riley, is Dermot going to be the one? Is he capable enough to, you know, uh, cover Riley? And and now Brody's going to play. I don't mind the Brody and Muzzin play, but it's just like it's going to take a while now. I think they're still trying to figure things out with these pairings as well. So um, I don't know, man. The goaltending's got to be at a <laughs> got to be awesome uh, for them to kind of pull these games out, especially with their upcoming schedule. That's for sure. And. We'll get to the Riley extension in just a moment. Uh, another big concern for me, probably the biggest, and I should have said this one first, biggest. is the no. power play. <laughs> this team, oh. like the past few playoffs, will live and die with this power play. They will either get eliminated or they will finally break through if the power play can actually start to click. Right now, it's basically at the point where as soon as the power play, that number one unit comes on the ice, I start to get a little bit of agite in my stomach for the non-Italian players. <laughs> I saw I that. You, you, you tried to spell that on Twitter. <laughs> I, I want to vomit in my mouth. Very, because it's, so, it's so pathetic to watch them just move the puck around, but nothing really happens. Pucks don't get to the net. And then you get the, the second unit come out. They have 30 seconds. They move the puck quick get the puck on net, and they actually get real chances and sometimes even score. So this power play, we said it at the beginning of the year, if we thought it would be fixed, it's not fixed, not even close to fixed, but they need it to be fixed because this team will not go where it needs to go if they don't fix it. And I don't even think it's a matter. I'm not blaming coaches anymore. This is squarely on the five guys that are on the ice at this point. At some point, you're good enough that you don't need a coach to tell you what to do. You should be able to find the open guys, make plays happen, and put the puck in the net once in a while. Yeah, I think it's uh, it, that number one use it, uh, unit has a lot of set plays, and they're forcing set plays. Well, they're not and working. And the other teams are adjusting. No, they're not working. But it's you know it, it's the high, it's the high tip. It's the you know now they move Barner over the the bumper position, and sure enough, Bunting's goal came from the bumper position. You know what I mean? So. It, it's almost but it like, wasn't remember, Barner who passed him the puck. No, it, it was not. It was Petsa. But, you know, I, I go back to a comment that Rob made uh, during last year, if you recall, Joe, and we laughed and said, you know, this power play is better without Austin Matthews on it. Maybe they are a better power play without Austin Matthews on it. I'm not going to agree to that. But what I'm going to say is we may have to revert back to what we were thinking about, breaking up the five. Because m- you might have guys on that unit now that might be might, might play a little simpler. If, you know, they're just getting pucks to net. I know we it, it's a cliche, put pucks on net. That's all it is. And it's the second unit is doing that. And there's, believe it or not, there's not a really a lot of high-skilled guys on the second unit. Like Pierre Engvall never played the power play ever in his tenure here in Toronto till this year. But what he's doing is him and Spezza 
10 feet in, top of the circle, shot on net, shot on net. And you got your net presence with a guy like Richie or even Bunting. So I, at what point do they start to really think about uh, maybe one or two changes, uh, maybe Spezza being on the top unit, maybe Bunting, we'll see. But who, the thing is, who do you take off? You know, you, you look at the contracts, Tavares has to be there with Matthews, right? He has to be there with Marner. Or do you go back to the accountability? Who cares? Split them up. You know, pair them off and split them up. So, at least the PK has been okay. Bobby, I, you want to say something? Go for I'd it. I'd love to tie this into the NFL. And uh, you're really in a tough spot, I feel, at least, because I'm telling you, the, the power play is better without Austin Matthews, but Austin Matthews is amazing, and you really can't take him off. But it's kind of like in Cleveland. Like, the, the Cleveland Browns are better when Odell Beckham doesn't play. It doesn't make any sense. Odell Beckham is a top five, seven receiver in the league, but they're better when he's not in. And it's kind of like Matthews where they're elite talents, but for some reason, like it's almost like they, they force feed the puck. And I thought they were more dynamic when he wasn't in. now to say they're better without him, you know, it's just different and it's more dynamic. And, you know, like Joe said, sometimes different is better. I'd like to address the start that you guys talked about. I believe the, what was the first question you asked Joe was, you know, what do you make cost, of the start? Cost, cost for, for optimism. And yeah, then so, uh, Frank here's said my, that we had actually had a good start against Detroit. So here's my thing. There was nothing really wrong with the start of the season. If you think about it, they they blew a couple games. All right. Like they were going to blow games come game 45, 46. This again goes back to the relationship between the fans and this team and this core is broken. And it has to be fixed. They blew a game to who, – who did they blow the game to where they were up and they, and they blew the lead and – oh, man – Anyway, it, and it was like game four of the season, and everybody's freaking out. It's like, that was going to happen at some point. They were going to lose games. But it's kind of like, you know, when you're in a, a relationship and you're upset with your partner, when they come home and it's a bad day, it seems to be a really bad day. And you might get on top of them, even though those days are normal and common. And they happen once a week, twice a week, once a month, twice a month. But you get on top of them because the relationship is damaged. And I think until this relationship is mended between this team – this fan base, I, 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 people are still just going to get on top of them for stuff that they shouldn't be getting on top of. Game four of the regular season is no reason to push the panic button. There's none. There's none for any team. The but, catch 22 of that is that it can't be mended until they actually win a playoff round. And or, that can't happen until April. So we're literally <laughs> going to be doing this from and, now until April. And that's why I said one of the players had to go. That's why I said one of the players one of the, the coaches, one of upper man, somebody had to go. And that's why I said this is all on the players and on the on upper management because. Well, let's segue that into who's going to go because they just signed Morgan Riley to a huge eight year contract extension. He's going to make seven point five a year. If you look at the defensive market, I mean, Adam Fox just got nine and a half from New York. And I'm not comparing right. him to Adam Fox because he's not as good, but he's in that top echelon of defensemen, you know, candidate for Team Canada's Olympic team, he probably would have, not probably, he would have definitely received more on the open market. He takes a haircut to stay here, but he does get the eight years. But now it brings up the question. They've got over $50 million tied up in five players. And the cap maybe goes up, what, a million bucks? If they're lucky, two million. Yeah. Something's got to give here. So does that change now happen? And and where does that change occur? See, the, the scary thing is they really don't have – they have quantity, but I don't think it's quality as replaceable parts. And what I mean by that is, like, look, Nick, now you can't even count on Nick Robertson. This is the third year in a row he's gotten hurt. Now you're starting to wonder if he can pull it together because he hasn't even played a full season of hockey in, in two years. But he was a guy that you had to absolutely hit on as part of your, your core coming up. But if you look at the Marlies team, okay, you got Hosang there again, but we still don't know, right? So there's not, a, there's not a, like, you know, we knew Sandine was going to be there at some point. We knew Lilligren was going to be there at some point. Guys that, you know, you, you kind of had a good feeling that somehow or some way they're going to be a regular. If you look at that forward group down there, uh, Derek Chinsev, it's just there's still a lot of unknowns. Alex Steve looks pretty good out of North Yeah, Notre he was. Uh, yep. So yeah. what I'm saying is, it these decisions are a lot easier to get rid of guys like Engvall, Mikheyev, uh, Kerfoot, 
who absolutely probably has to go now because that that's an albatross. Um, you know, uh, do you, can you resign Spezza even at the minute? Like all these kind of fringe guys all add up, but you have to replace them somehow. And I think this is where you got caught in that thing where it started with Connor Brown, Andreas Janssen, Kasperi Captain, all making in that two and a half to four million dollar range. Those are pieces that you need, but you couldn't keep. It's those guys that took the fall. If you keep trying to replace these guys with seven hundred thousand dollars or these guys from Russia at eight hundred k, that's really it, it. It really really thins you out even more. Um, so and plus you still have to now you have to resign Campbell. So you're probably gonna get another three there. Uh, you still have a couple RFAs to do. Uh, Sandine, which I probably will get the Dermot uh, bridge. So do you know it? It's not impossible, but Joe, can you see them trading five or six guys in between, you know, trade deadline in the summer? That's a lot. That's a, that's a lot of transactions, right? Yeah. Um, Nick Ritchie, two and a half million. That looks, that looks like a bad contract. Is that a buyout? You know, um, it, but then again, Joe, we've sat here for a, a year and a bit now saying and, and hearing people say, oh, they're in cap hell, yet they always come out of it. So you can't say, oh, you know, they're not going to come out of it. It's just like what that's going to look like. You know, to me, Kerfoot looks expendable now. He, he does. Like, he, he, I'm sure he's a nice piece. But you're telling me you can't find somebody that does what he does for less than three and a half million? You know, you got to look at the obvious things, right? So um, I, I might even say, Joe, uh, I might even say we could see a, a trade for a defenseman any uh, pretty soon because – Though they can't keep going the way they're going with this defense core if, if they're going to keep playing like that. So maybe Kerfoot's that guy that goes uh, in the next month or so. Who knows? Oh, yeah. What, what kind of defenseman is Alex Kerfoot going to get you? Joe, I, I, I think he has some decent value uh, across the league. You, got, you, you have to look at teams that have the ability. I'm not saying he's, a, he's an attractable asset, but when you add maybe a second-round pick or third-round pick with Kerfoot, for a defenseman, then you might get something. You probably have to add something with it, but you're killing two birds with one stone, right? You're telling me yeah. he can't be serviceable on a team like Calgary or maybe yeah, Arizona? That's, no, that's, that's you know? not what I'm saying. I'm not saying he can't be serviceable, but serviceable players don't go for top four defensemen, which is what they need. They got enough five, six guys. No, no, you're right. You're right. But you know who the biggest piece is here that, that really um, is hurting them most? You can say, yeah, Hyman was, was a huge loss. That Zach Bogosian loss is really hurting this defense core. And he played, what, a 5-6 role? So that's yeah. the type of guy Tough I'm saying you might. Too. You know what I mean? So kind that's the type of guy. Up. And those type of guys are out there, I think, for a guy like Kerfoot. Okay, so you may not get enough. a top four, but you get a serviceable guy like a Bogosian filled in because he could have played top four minutes uh, when they did have injuries. So that's the kind of trade I'm looking for. Bobby, do you like the Riley extension? What do you think from a non-Toronto fan perspective? I'm not a like I, I, I don't want to say I like Riley, and I don't want to say I I really like Riley. He's you know he's serviceable. I don't I think there are times where he does uh, some silly stuff, but for seven and a half, I I'm okay with that number. Looking around, you saw I believe Vancouver gave Ekman Larson is paying them nine, I believe, or eight and a half, something in that area. And then you know, so I, I thought he's to really because i think he was gonna get over eight i think he's kind of the first guy to finally take a, like a bit of a discount so exactly. you know it, it's it finally happened that one of them i still you know unless the cap goes up like crazy which i don't think it will i i think one of the big guys has to be moved and just given the fact that nylander seems to be a good deal matthews is untradeable and um Tavares basically has a no trade clause. There's really only one guy left. So I I, I still think that he's going to have to be moved for just for salary cap reasons. Yeah, but 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 Dubas gave him his word. So, no, but he never. <laughs> he's he not going to Marner. Yeah, he's Marner. I'm, oh, I'm okay. saying Marner. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were Nylander. Okay, sorry. No, Nylander. Like, I'm not a big Nylander guy, but the, the contract looks good now. I don't can think I, you can argue. Can I just jump in there for one second? Rob made a good point, Joe. Riley did himself a huge uh, uh, favor. He took less 
it, it, during the season, mind you, that his contract took less than we would got on the market, which means the media, the fans, they give him a pass. You know what I mean? He didn't. He he could have sat out. He could have left. Right. He he could have went. He could have got more, or he could have resigned with Toronto for eight and a half, nine. at the end of the season, but he did what Nealander and Marner couldn't do. It makes him very likable, and I think gives him eases the stress on that team. Secondly, I think this was a good move telling those core four guys, because Riley's respected in the room, that maybe he sees, you know, maybe he's trying to tell them, listen, guys, I'm here for the long term. Maybe alluding to a guy like Austin Matthews in due time, that maybe this is, you know, we have something here we have to do with us for. You kind of, it's almost like planting a seed a bit, because he could have left. He's been the longest serving guy here. And if Riley leaves the organization, that could have been, I think, disastrous for Austin Matthews. Just my perception. So I might be reading too far into it, but I think it, it, it serves kind of two purposes with signing that deal. All right. We shall see. Like anything, it's definitely going to be a, ne- a, de- a really interesting uh, year in Leafland uh, throughout this season and the next. So see how it shakes out. all shakes out. So 